by far the best introduction in my career. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> I'm just going to drop the mic and walk. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Do I really have to talk after that? <laughs> pleasure to be here. Oh, it's all good. Uh, no, pleasure to be here. Uh, and again, I will, uh, Kevin mentioned about some ideas that were really resonates with me, and that is this idea of a conductor. Architecture is about uh, engaging everything and using those parameters uh, to produce archi good architecture. It's never this idea of the cape and long down and waving your wand and pretend the pretentiousness of a star architect. That does not exist. Uh, it should never exist. It's really about working collectively, collaboratively with neighborhoods and clients, social activists, activists, all that. And that's what is what we do. That's what uh, makes my life worthwhile. I love doing that. So on that note, uh, and a little bit about me, I am the founding principal, creative director of uh, Lorcan Early Architects, LOHA for short. Uh, we do have offices both in LA and Detroit uh, and have projects throughout the US right now, which I'm very excited about. It takes a long time. I've been doing it 30 years or so, and it's taken me that long to be able to expand the bandwidth of the work. Um, I am going to discuss the ideas that underpin the work. Very important, what is the idea underpinning it? And also speaking about material exploration and design strategies that elevate each of our projects. So those are the driving forces of the presentation today. So each project you're going to see do demonstrates our, our commitment to artistry. That's very important. It has to exist. But critical to it is having social equity in your work, to have a recognizing that you are there to elevate the human condition, whether it's to live, work, or play. And that's what we do as architects. And that's something that is close to my heart. <clears throat> I do believe that the role of architect is to do work of consequence. Also, to embrace architecture as a social act. Kevin mentioned that. That's something that's critical to me. When I did my master's degree at uh, the AA, my dissertation many years ago was called Towards New Models of Social Connectivity. So it's very interesting to be studying and to bring those ideas to the practice of architecture. And that's what has been the underpinned idea of our work. Very important to do that. So it's not about designing a building as an object but how to use architecture as a tool for engaging politics, aesthetics, smart growth, and social structures. We engage with housing, urbanism, and culture to elevate cities. That's what drives the work. <clears throat> I'd like to give a little bit of background on myself. I am uh, uh, Irish. I was born in Dublin, Ireland. I came to the US when I was two or three. Thus, I sound American. But my soul is Irish, but I sound American. My father was an actor, and so we traveled extensively through my childhood. I was very fortunate. I got to see all the world with my dad on location. So we spent months at a time in film locations in places like, as you can see in these images, whether it's Florence, Rome, Madrid, Barcelona, Russia, uh, all these places as, as a young child. Uh, at the time, I was frustrated to have to travel so much, but boy, am I thrilled that I'm able to do it. To understand culture, to recognize different people, embrace different cultures, very important to me. So I feel that DNA is still in me. So these were formative experiences, the exposure to different cultures, seeing how people lived, engaged with their cities, very important. And uh, it, it, in a sense, set the path of what I wanted to do and sparked my interest in architecture. When you're in cities like this and you recognize the complexities and uniqueness of these cities, that's something that embraced, that's excited me, and that's what I embrace. So, when I ultimately settled in Los Angeles and began my practice, I brought some of these sensibilities to, with me. And I do think having been born in Ireland and having lived in Europe for, I lived in Ireland also between the age of seven and 15, I went to school in Europe, primarily in Ireland. Uh, so I think when I came to Los Angeles, I had a duality going on here with a, kind of a, a commitment to the experiences I had in Europe, but also recognizing the other aspects of that I can apply to cities in the US. So these experiences did shape uh, my kind of uh, belief in public space. Uh, I also believe right now, given the pandemic and what we've all gone through, is that we are in a very different time. And social media and other technologies, in a sense, become the new realm of public space. But it's paradoxically more and more isolated us. And so that's critical, is to understand that duality. Very helpful one way, but also pulled away, because I'm convinced our, uh, human beings are social at heart and to engage each other is very important. So that plays a role in the work that I do. So it is critical than ever to design spaces that bring us together. <clears throat> As we look at urban sprawl, whether it's Los Angeles or Detroit or other areas in the dense conditions, 
You can see that our task as architects is to find opportunities to design spaces and to, to, to create interaction for people in those spaces. So we do that. We uh, likewise bring aspects of public realm uh, into our projects. This is an idea of borrowing space from, pro from public domain. So this is just a project, student housing at UCLA. So the idea that you can create and activate these outdoor decks and provide opportunities for students to study. Equally so, this project in West Hollywood where the idea was to provide a public pocket park on private land. That idea of borrowing space from private developments for the community. Very interesting idea. So we believe in that and we believe that the projects benefit from this move. <clears throat> We do explore multiple strategies for buildings, whether it be material exploration, pattern, identity, geometry, or color. I like color. I think Kevin mentioned that I did spend two years uh, as an artist, a painter in New York City, in Tribeca, a magical time after I worked on the Louvre Museum for four years. So it was very wedded to, in my world that art was important. Uh, although the Louvre was more primarily showing Greek and Roman antiquities, I love the idea of being involved with that culture of being art. So um, I do believe that plays a role. And you can see in these images, there's a balance of multiple ideas throughout the work. But color also is an architectural material. So I do play that uh, <laughs> strategy in terms of the work. And there is multiple projects on our website. I'm only going to show five or six today, but there's access to those if you choose to see them. So I'm going to start with the work in Detroit as opposed to LA, because that's the closest, uh, uh, more recent work we've been doing. So Detroit and LA, in a sense, are highly unique. The experience we have in LA's complex neighborhoods is very different than the work we're doing in Detroit, which has informed us how working to advance the community-driven goals and social priorities are critical. Now, Detroit is a, is a fascinating place to work right now. It's about optimism for the future. It's about trying to find ways to work the planning department, working with the neighborhood communities to really bring some um, social equity and also urban renewal to that city. It needs it. And so to me, that's something that was unique to Detroit, which I learned from. Detroit, uh, Los Angeles is somewhat unique in that way. It is not, uh, it is not structured the same way as Detroit. <clears throat> so those are very important. So working with the community uh, and social priorities that we came across in Detroit was extremely important for me personally and our practice professionally. So we did set up an office in 2015 in Detroit, and we are working on 10 projects as we speak, a variety of different scales, from museums to master planning communities. So these neighborhood studies were very important to me as well. Uh, all that's very important. So as we may know, Los Angeles and Detroit are vastly different landscapes and conditions. In LA, we are confronted with how strategically designed products for dense infill lots. It's about stitching into a very, very dense horizontal uh, uh, city. And you saw that first image of the lecture. That's Los Angeles. Very little land was available. So our, our projects tend to be that way. It's infill lots. It's about stitching into the city. Detroit, we're faced with the inverted figure ground relationship in a sense. What we're dealing with, dramatically underdeveloped neighborhood fabric. Empty streets, uh, uh, like this, for example, where you have fields everywhere. How do you build for now? but look to the future, what's happening next. So that's a very interesting dichotomy between the two. And that's something that's very important to me to recognize those issues. So we are faced with these unique situations. Uh, Detroit is rooted in large civic strategies. It's about looking at how we can move forward. Uh, I do work with the city of Detroit on multiple projects. Uh, we've done three neighborhood studies, which I'll show briefly. I'll try to consolidate three large neighborhood studies into about three minutes here, but very important to me. It was over a year and a half studies that I was working with the city of Detroit to really understand the city, very extraordinary. So with that in mind, we do have to and recognize that there's neglect that's happened through all the neighborhoods in Detroit, that black communities have been struggled. The urban renewal and urban, uh, in a sense, the social equity was brought to downtown, but not to the neighborhoods. So our work is all in the neighborhoods, a very important shift, a paradigm shift from what happened before. In the old days, it was about bringing urban renewal to downtown Detroit and look to a trickle down effect and perhaps hit the neighborhoods. The strategy right now is the opposite. It's turning that idea inside out and going into the neighborhoods and have this kind of kindred, kindred spirited 
uh, developers, nonprofits working with us to do that insertion into the neighborhoods. This is one of them in Brush Park, this image you're looking at right now. So that's extremely important is to how to find that idea where you can, in a sense, provide this new, uh, new approach. It's all about the neighborhoods. You know, despite the, uh, the, the strategy of these things, these areas have to, have to really recognize that back in the 50s, it was a place where there was uh, wonderful places. There were large, there was houses, there was wonderful kind of, uh, in a sense, um, mansions where people were living in. And of course, through this downturn, when of course the auto industry moved out of town in Detroit, it changed. It went into, it went into disrepair. Detroit's metropolis of 1.7 million uh, dropped to 700,000 people. So one can envision that incredible shift in a city. And that's something that's critical to what we're doing there right now, is to try to go back and put it into new renewal into these areas that need it. So despite this economic, deep economic decline, a new Detroit is slowly re-emerging. Most of the renewal has been downtown, the old Civic Center, uh, where Detroit native Dan Gilbert uh, relocated his business, Quicken Loans. I think he brought 17,000 jobs to Detroit with his company, Quicken Loans. At the time, this incipient economic revival was sequestered in downtown, where historic Art Deco buildings were being restored and formerly vacant lots developed. Today, however, skyrocketing rents have spurred growth outside. So now there's an emphasis and emphasis to go to the neighborhoods and begin to create those environments uplifting environments around the edges and the perimeters of Detroit. Very important. So in a sense, Detroit's rise from ashes is, is happening. And I'm very proud to be part of that. And it is happening. I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to be Detroit recently, but there are areas and pockets of Corktown, Old Redford, Milwaukee Junction, other areas of Detroit where it is coming back in a very good way. But it's not downtown, it's the other parts. And I believe that this will have legacy. It will have longevity, and that's what, um, we hope, and I believe my colleagues also in Detroit are, are committed to as well. So what I'm going to talk briefly about, and again, three to five minutes for very long studies, uh, our experience working with civic leaders, city planners, and community advocates throughout Detroit resulted in three studies of series of neighborhoods along Grand River Boulevard. And this is the primary area what I'm referring to right there. So these are areas that are very important to Detroit that went into disrepair. We are in very much involved in that process of really addressing that issue. And three of our studies are all along that particular street. It's the, uh, uh, we did the, um, the Northwest Detroit neighborhood study, six square mile area we study. We also did the Russell Woods and Arden Park, which is the second one. And the third one is an area called Milwaukee Junction. Three areas all within this very important artery in Detroit. So the goal of the studies was to devise urban design strategies that would direct effect result-driven implementation to key areas that have received very little economic development. What's interesting about these studies is that uh, Maurice Cox, who's uh, become a very uh, dear friend and colleague over the years, he was the planning department in, in Detroit. He's now in Chicago, equally interesting city to be working with, but he was committed to this idea of implementation. If we're gonna do these studies, how do we make sure we can implement them? And that's always a challenge when you look at master plannings and you look at these idea of neighborhood studies. They tend to be large, pie in the sky ideas, but they're not embedded in reality. How can we come up with solutions that can be implemented? And I think that's the critical aspect of what we're doing there. And I have to say, to Maurice Cox's credit, he was instrumental in that. He would push and challenge us to be able to say, how can we make this work? And that, to me, was critical, because sometimes you don't get that pushback, and you, you produce these neighborhood studies, and they find, them in a drawer, find themselves in a drawer, and they're never uh, implemented. We are implementing these ideas, which is very exciting. <clears throat> One of them, which is this area called Northwest Detroit, but primarily Old Redford, uh, and I'll just briefly mention that the study was a much larger six square mile, but we focused on very specific areas of along this particular main uh, uh, Gr uh, Grand River Avenue. The key was that these were areas in which the artists had gone to already. They have started painting murals. They went into broken down buildings and fixed glasses. They fixed the lights outside. Did some critical aspects of trying to elevate those areas because the city, in a sense, walked away. They weren't helping these neighborhoods. So we pinpointed those areas as areas that are crucial 
there's one particular area which is my client, which is a gentleman by the name of John George has a company called Blight Busters, and his whole, his whole business is about going into areas that have blight and trying to fix them. So this area was, our, our strategy was primarily focused on these three key areas, and we we're very excited to say that that was something that was uh, uh, embraced by the planning department. And then zooming in even further, this is the vision for Northwest Detroit area, particularly the Obama building. This is a building on this corner that's called the Obama because there's a mural of uh, Michelle and Barack dancing there. So they historically landmarked this bank. And then we, this was our strategy in terms of the larger neighborhood study. What's really what we're very excited about is a client that approached us to go into our larger study and focus on this particular area. So we ended up renovating this building. Very exciting. So what we did is renovated the bank, but we also brought in affordable housing, arts-related programs. We also made uh, uh, minority-based uh, uh, um, retail also part of the equation. So this was what I was saying. We looked at the larger brushstroke idea about the bigger idea. We zoomed in, were able to implant it. So this was the implementation. For me, very interesting as an architect because you're always dealing with the idea of urban, urban design, urban strategies, and architecture. How do you combine the two? This represents an effort. This is what we were given. That was a billboard that was falling apart. Unfortunately, I wanted to keep it, but they wouldn't let us. So the mural that was here was actually a painting that was right on this corner. We put, placed that inside the actual building, so this became a gallery. Uh, in the front area. The affordable housing we provided out in this area right here, and this is the minority-owned retail, all of which, if you go there on this corner, are all now uh, fully vested. We have four different uh, companies who are th in there. So this is what's interesting about Detroit. You can implement these ideas, and you can, can start from a big idea. So that's one that I'm very excited about. There's a number of other things we've done, but I just focus on this one. Equally so, the second one was about Russell Woods and Arden Park. Really interesting area because uh, this particular area here was a very rather kind of, uh, in a way, m carefully, lovingly restored. This area, Narden Park, went to absolute disrepair. There was no commitment, no focus on this area. So we were trying to find what are the historical uh, significance of these different areas. So we recognized great buildings in there. We wanted to amplify the historical character and support cultural heritage. So primarily critical issues in terms of larger study was to address those issues. Equally so, Narden Park here was to stabilize single family residential homes. They had tons of houses that were empty, some that were burned out, and some of that were boarded up. So the idea is what can we save and what can we let go? So we did a very, uh, very strategic study of all the houses that we can bring back to life. And then we had the courage to recommend getting rid of the others. Very important because otherwise, if you have in a community where you have you know, 150 burnout houses, it doesn't give uplifting or kind of inspirational uh, messages. So we, we went in there and made that, and they've done it. They've actually gone in and cleaned up the area. Very interesting, these two areas. Equally so, we proposed ideas. Uh, needless to say, one of the key issues is address issues of roads and streets in Detroit. They're very wide, long very much against the life of pedestrians. So we were able to propose ideas and medians, provide bike paths, and all these very simple, basic concepts. In a sense, slow down the car. It is a, a critical thing in Detroit when you go there. You, you're, you're, in a sense, your life is at risk if you try to cross streets there. So we feel that this is critical. It's a very simple idea. Slow the traffic, slow the car. And so that was one of the that we did here. Equally so, we proposed ideas that we could bring art-related uh, programs in terms of uh, you know, uh, opportunities for the artists can go and also community-driven programs. This is being built right now. Uh, and that's an idea that we also proposed. Very interesting. There's simply community rooms, areas that people can go and hang out and paint. Equally so, in that area, they have these houses that we believe was important to save. Well, we came up with a six-step process, or five-step process, forgive me, in doing that. And what was interesting is they don't have the resources to renovate the whole building, for example. But what if you took a step one and you were able to provide and build one unit in that building? And, and, and will the plan, planning department willing to accept the fact that you're only renovating a portion of it in terms of C O of O and being able to say that that's acceptable? They agreed, the planning department, that if someone wanted to buy a building and they didn't have the resources to renovate the whole building, they could renovate a portion of it. And that was the strategy we worked with the city. I'm very proud to say that they're doing that in Detroit now, and it's helping because in Detroit, they don't have the resource to renovate these extraordinary buildings. But 
renovate a portion. It'll be a catalyst for change. Perhaps if you have a unit, there'll be other people come in and say, okay, I wanna renovate mine. So this represents this idea. Do the first one, which is a, you know, obviously a structure, foundation, clear open space. Second one, um, renovate a portion for lease one. Then you come back to the second one. Then you build a stair and then you build the upper units. So this idea of incrementally bringing life to Detroit, this works. And it's highly unique because it's rare that you have permits to renovate a portion part of the building. And I'm, I'm convinced that this is going to help Detroit because they don't have the resource to take on these very wonderful buildings. Equally so, we are deeply involved in other projects. So moving forward, this is uh, a project in City Modern and Brush Park in Detroit. It's a historical neighborhood of regal Victorian red brick buildings uh, built in the 1850s. Uh, it's, the pre, it's Detroit's pre-automotive elite. This was the corner, an area where they had uh, very uh, uh, robust resources. This was an area that was extraordinary, but it went into, obviously, decline. So with that in mind, <clears throat> let's see what's going on here, sorry. Um, there we go. So this is a picture, forgive me, this is a picture of the site. It's an aerial uh, image of the neighborhood before the project was built, and it's exactly what I was referring to earlier, an area where you had open fields. These were the four or five, these are the four Victorian houses that were renovated, and that was our site. It was a two block, one block this way and two block that way was the whole size of the City Modern Project. Uh, our task was to design the four corner buildings of this particular development, which is the largest development since uh, Mises Lafayette Park, which is an extraordinary project in Detroit. This is the largest one since then. And it is with Bedrock. Uh, Dan Gilbert's company is part of this commitment to go to the neighborhoods. This is like a midtown area of Detroit. It's not the outskirts, but the midtown. But it's very interesting. Not only was he building in downtown, but he made the commitment to go out there. I interviewed for this project not knowing what, what I got. Ultimately, I was able to get the four corner buildings uh, on this larger development. Uh, I'm very excited about that because it was about to create the idea of these corners, it kind of anchors and it kind of, in a sense, um, uh, in a way, bookends this particular development. But also the central area of this development was very interesting. It had a paseo down the middle. You got one right there and you have another one that's meandering through, all open. There's no fences around it. There's no way of saying, hey, this is our development. You go away. This is about bringing people into this area. There was bioswales in the middle. Uh, our strategy was somewhat unique in the sense that we wanted to be sensitive to historical buildings and also the low slung character of the neighborhoods. Very important. Each of the buildings uh, that you're looking at that we did is addressing issues of adjacent buildings, addressing issues of massing of the buildings, whether it's a two-story townhouses, duplexes, or adjacent buildings across the street. So we were manipulating our buildings that, in a sense, was responding accordingly. Uh, how we did it was to start to look at all the different uh, strategies we had, one of which was uh, we were given this as our party by our client. We weren't going to do that. Well, it's going to be just a big box. So what we did is we adjusted to the context. So each of the building was, was in a sense, modified. This was a key one. This was one of our buildings. This was a Victorian house right here. So we wanted to step the massing down. So this was commensurate to that scale. Equally so, the larger scale was, in a sense, tied into the larger uh, massing. So towards the middle, we dropped the buildings, one, two, three, four, towards the middle to this area, in a sense, welcoming the scale of what the whole larger development is. So you can manipulate massing to do it, and it does work. You have to be, you, you have to be very, you're very challenged because you have a mandate of 35 units per building. So how do you produce 35 units when you're given this by the client, and you're saying, we have penciled it out that you're gonna need to do this to get what we need. We were able to address it by virtue of saying, why don't we go to seven stories or six stories in one area and drop the massing elsewhere? And they bought the idea. They thought, yes, it's worth it. Design is important. Drop the scale in certain areas. And we came up with a strong argument with the client to go to six stories in certain buildings where they were looking to do four stories. And so that's very important. You can take a building and a client comes to you and says, look, this is our mandate. I want you to do this. You have the right as an architect to go back and say, well, we will give you your units, but if we work with the massing and we get you what you want, it's gonna work better in the community. And that's what we're able to do. So we're very happy about doing that. We gave them what they wanted. So the, what we did primarily is looking at the different massing, which is very important. <clears throat> Equally so, green space was critical. We're now activating all those roofs. Well, why don't we bring the decks? 
bring green space, very important. So that was a key issue of the project as well. So here you can see that we have uh, you know, each of the buildings, uh, all the uh, horizontal bands as we went from three story to six stories were activated for outdoor spaces. And equally so, use the buildings for rainwater collection. And that's what we did. So each building is built into the rainwater, which is collected in barrels and redirected to the bioswale, which is right here. So very interesting, you take building, you take architecture and buildings and actually address issues of uh, uh, rainwater collection, address issues of green space, address issues of adjacencies and how you, how you, how you in a sense, uh, uh, kind of in a sense, engage communities. And I think all those moments are the forces I'm talking about, social, political, economic, but they actually make your buildings better if you really see them as assets as opposed to constraints. And uh, that's, I think, is very important as, the, as an architect. Just a few construction shots. This is our first building. You can see Detroit in the distance right here, and here's our building. And another shot under construction. And here it is finished. And this represents uh, an interesting image because there's the Victorian house, which was also restored. So you can do old and new. You can do adjacencies. And I have a, a bit of a history with that in Los Angeles where I built next to the Schindler House many years ago. Very challenging project. I just finished a project next to a Neutra project. These are very significant modernist architects, but uh, also you have to recognize that in, when you build in the city, you are engaging what's surrounding around you. So this was the same strategy we took. Uh, we, we did choose this idea of an urban palette, uh, materially-wise speaking. Uh, we looked at different cladding of these buildings, brick, wood, and metal. Those are found all over Detroit. So that's what we, we embraced. And to be able to go back to the client and say, look, we want to work with these different materials. It recognizes the culture and the significance of the urban palette that exists. And they bought the idea. Uh, our challenge was to, say, to tell them, well, we want to wrap the whole building out of cedar. Now, most clients go, we're not doing that. You're going to do a portion in wood, but we want some mix of other materials. Our, our role is to argue the case that this is a clarity of an idea. It doesn't need to have four or five different materials to break the scale. Just the nature of the building is doing it, so thus we can come up with a big idea. Thus, you'll see in all the four, on the four buildings all the same material. Uh, strategic cuts in it are changed materials in those areas, but this one, for example, Wood was interesting, we bought the, they bought the idea that cedar is everywhere throughout Detroit. It should gray out, uh, which is fine. I have no problem with these things aging correctly. So this project is interesting in the sense that when you have a site like Press Park, you need to reimagine the future of the site and you look forward to how the buildings can act as a catalyst for change. What's very exciting about this Brush Park, or City Modern is the term that Bedrock uses, uh, it is working that way. There are buildings being built around. There's uh, retail coming in, there's cafes coming in. And it's very interesting because for over 40 years, nothing happened in this area. So there is a benefit of architecture. It contributes, people are, are drawn to it. So you can do this in cities when you need it. So this is our, our one of the four uh, that we worked on. So you can see that as you go through all the four buildings, you'll see each one is clad in different materials. You'll see the massing is different. And that's also an interesting story. Um, when they approached me, they wanted me to do four buildings, but two designs. And they wanted me to design two and then flip it on each corner of this larger development. I argued the case that each corner has a different contextual sit sitting or siting, meaning that the buildings around were different, the scale, proportion, where it is in the city. And they said, okay, you know, we'll call your bluff. You come back, show us what you're talking about, and then we'll see if we'll, we'll buy into it. So what we did is we built efficiency into the overall design of all four buildings. We explained it's the same strategy we're using. Uh, all the demising walls are stacked vertically. All the bathrooms, uh, kitchens are ver uh, stacked vertically. That freed us up to do this. And we argued the case that a cost of wood or cedar versus brick or metal was commensurate to each other. And they bought the idea. Whereas I think their default was we want one material and we want all uh, two designs, one material on four corners. They bought the idea and to their credit, they gave us some more money because we were looking at new ideas on each of them. So um, some more details of John R. You can see that we have, the, of course, the, uh, the uh, hallways and then outdoor spaces. So each of these deck areas were activated with outdoor space, which is very, very rare in Detroit. And it's not something that's it's done because, of course, you have snow, you have inclement weather. But they bought the idea that this is important because there are times in the summer and other areas where these could be used. So very, very happy to say that they, uh, 
uh, bought the idea. There's just another view showing the larger scale building that popped up after we finished ours, so it is working. Uh, just the deck areas looking uh, to the neighborhood, and you can see the interesting uh, quality here. There's your uh, Victorian house across the street. So it's really interesting to be able to have the mix between old and new, and that's how cities are. <clears throat> Interior, we brought the idea of the cedar into the lobby, just carrying that simple idea. And the units were very basic. It's very hard to uh, you know, be able to bring too many ideas in the interior of these buildings just because there are going to be different tenants there. Uh, there's 30% uh, of them are affordable. Uh, uh, one, one building is completely affordable. The other three are 30, 70 a mix. But you can see, since we weren't really in a position to really put tremendous amount of uh, effort into the inside, the one thing we could control is floor to ceiling glass which means the light filters through in a very unique way. If you flush condition window, and we do it, and I saw some extraordinary projects today that Kevin has done. He gave me a tour and uh, uh, flush detailing. All these things are great. You can do in different projects. Those ideas, we believe, can find its way in a very more, more budget, con <laughs> budget condition, but one can actually bring it to this. So this move here turned out to be a really interesting move. Um, the ceilings are about nine foot six, highly unique, but we fought that idea. Give it a more height and one simple move, window, floor to ceiling, and those two moves make the space better. And that was what we can contribute to uh, all the uh, uh, buildings. And our second building is, of course, embracing this idea. Uh, it's called Edmund 200, and this is a charcoal gray brick building. It steps down from 76 feet down to a three-story volume, actually, forgive me, two-story volume. Uh, breaks the massing down uh, to a typical apartment building, as you can see in the beyond. This is our um, wood building. This is our brick building, and that's our metal building right there. So each of these began to have a dialogue with each other. These corners start to have this in, uh, dialogue, and then the in-between uh, townhouses and duplexes, they start to work proportionally. <clears throat> we did work with ideas uh, within the brick, so it's always about what's the material and what can we do with it. And this one I like because it talks about not only vertically your building with the kind of manip manipulating the the, the volume of the building, but also in terms of plan. You can step it back to give that scale and proportion that begins a little bit more uh, unique. And this is a very rational building, but architecturally, the proportions of the window, the quality of the material, all those things start to work. And that was something we were trying to really push, that you can do simple buildings, but it's a, uh, if you have a design strategy and recognize the material, the ideas, the structure, what you're dealing with, you can make it into architecture. <clears throat> Equally so, third building, brush 2665. This was concrete panels. Again, same idea. Uh, again, where possible, have these strategic cuts or folds in the building, providing outdoor spaces. Uh, and not only does that provide great outdoor spaces, but it makes the massing more interesting. So you can see there's these opportunities to start to uh, 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 bring, uh, kind of in a sense, energy and excitement to these uh, uh, buildings. There's now a, a, a retail space, it's a cafe called Bodega has moved in, which is really helpful if for the area. <clears throat> Again, interior, simple idea. This one we flush the window to the base, but not at the top. And the last of the four is this one. So the building at the northwest in intersection is uh, Studio 320. And again, we use vibrant red metal because we felt that there are going to be clients or potential tenants who are willing to live in a red building. And there was. They had no problem renting this out. So again, but this was also a larger story. How do you take these four corner buildings, work with the kind of, in a way, the grain or the, or the tapestry of the city, and recognize that you want these in cities. You want to have juxtaposition of buildings, material, and ideas. <clears throat> More ideas of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the building. We didn't fold this back in one corner because it was just, uh, formally it was very interesting because the sun, the way the sun works, just folding back that one corner uh, was a very important move. And here you can see, same idea. You know, you do have a conditioned hallway, but we were able to uh, shorten that distance and provide these outdoor spaces throughout these buildings. Again, Detroit is not a place like in Los Angeles where you can access your unit from outside. In Detroit, the weather's different. We as architects, uh, you guys and, and uh, collectively, all, all of us have to recognize that how do you build how is a different building in Detroit for Los Angeles? That's the key issue. LA, you can, most of my work is access from exterior for the units. Detroit, we did have to recognize that you had to really uh, handle it differently, and that was something that uh, obviously the clients were made it clear. And there's a big picture 
looking down towards Detroit. This is the development. This one is now under construction. We, we're not doing that one, but it's a, another development of these townhouses. The other architects in this particular uh, development is really wonderful architects. Uh, Elizabeth Whitaker, uh, a firm called Merge, and she teaches at GSD, and she did the townhouses. And there was a firm in, in Chicago, Studio Dwell. So it was really nice to work with three or four architects. And there was a, a, a local architect, Hamilton Associates, who also did another building. So it's a very interesting mix of four architects tackling this larger development. And being able to work together was really interesting. But very important for me personally to go through this process and recognize these buildings uh, that, that in a sense, uh, how it contributes back to Detroit, how you can do this architecture, bring design, elevate the design, and it brings people there. And that's very exciting for us to be able to make this work. <clears throat> in a sense, you're trying to restitch the urban fabric with these type of projects. And it certainly was wonderful that Bedrock had the resources and were committed to do it because it was during the pandemic they were finishing these. And there was tremendous issues of supply chain, availability of materials and all that, but they were committed to it. So to their credit, uh, they did it and uh, really, really excited that they were able to see this through. <clears throat> uh, this would be a good shift to LA, color, red building Detroit, and then we're going to, um, a very important project to me and frankly, I'm. Um, happy that you guys put it on your poster. It's, uh, it was a, t a kind of tipping point in my practice when I did this one. So in Los Angeles, as mentioned, uh, it has great horizontal density. The bulk of the work we're doing there in LA is about inserting buildings in the city. It's all about that. We never rarely get a site where there's empty lots next to it. It's always built in already. So we have to insert these buildings. Very important. So this particular project is highly unique. It's called Formosa 1140. And it's what we, we did it in West Hollywood, Los and California. It's a real interesting city, creative community, open to ideas, which is exciting. So the story behind this project is that uh, LA is notoriously uh, uh, known as a city that has very little uh, uh, urban public space. It isn't like other cities. It's all privatized. Rarely do you have the opportunity in the city, in the core of the city, to be able to walk to a park. Uh, you can get in your car drive to the beach, or you drive up to the mountain, or you go to Griffith Park. But you have to get in your car to go. So this argument on this project was different, and you'll see where I'm getting at. So we were addressing the condition of these urban infills, but one key idea. We parceled out a third of the privately owned building site as a publicly managed pocket park by the city of West Hollywood. And that's a very unique approach, meaning that we were able to take uh, this site, which is here's the full property line, Write that. And these are actually drawings we do in our office. They're called digital Pantone. I, my background in art, I do bring that to the work. It's, I'm obsessed about that. I probably should have been an artist, but I became an architect. So, But I do think I work with the tools within the tools and medium of architecture, meaning uh, how do you build? <laughs> but there are ideas I bring to it. And also within the drawings, I bring that aspect to it. So these are uh, drawings we do in each project, which shows a soul of an idea or a key, a kind of a, the soul of what we're trying to do. Um, on that note, the idea was to take a third portion of the site and allocate that for a public park of park, and it's on private land. So very interesting concept. So the premise behind this project is that there was a house on the site. The city came to my client and said, we do not have, uh, uh, you do not have the right to tear this house down. So if you want to put 11 units on the site, you have to keep that house and find a way to make it work. Well, we looked at multiple ideas. How do we keep this house, which is not architecturally significant, had zero uh, uh, structural capacity. It was a, basically, it was a crack house. Uh, uh, the neighbors wanted it out, but the city told my client, you have to keep it. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to build your 11 units. So we brainstormed a client and I and said, okay, if we can't, since we simply can't keep this house, tuck parking underneath it, underpin it, and then build 11 units around this house right here. So we came back and said, okay, what can we do? What can we give back to the city to allow us to actually build it? And that was a very important moment. Courtyard housing in LA is extremely uh, common. You have these type of buildings where you have these buildings wrapped, uh, pushed to the edge of the property line, of course, with the three to five foot setbacks. Then you have this courtyard housing in the middle, which is beautiful. You have one right here, which is extraordinary in your building. That's the basic premise of it. So uh, in principle, here's the courtyard housing topology. 
That's what you end up in the city of LA with edge, hard edges on that perimeter. And then you have these really nice common open spaces that are just for the people in the building. So there's your idea of how you can develop. Our strategy was what if we modify that premise, you push the building edge, create the building one, on one side and create this area as quote unquote the courtyard, but it's a modified one, meaning that it's a hybrid between the common open space requirements for the building, but also a public park for the city. And the city allowed us to do it. Normally it's different. They don't allow your common open space to overlap anything else. So we were able to uh, uh, pitch the idea that we will get this, the client willing to uh, lease this third of this a portion of the, bill, uh, the site to the city for $1 for 99 years if they run the park. They bought the idea, we were able to build a project. So in the end, it led to this concept that what if you had contiguous open spaces? And if you were to able to do it, that's the nature of what you have. Perhaps these could connect someday, different ways of looking at the city. That was the idea that drove the idea of uh, the project. I'll go through very quickly. Uh, it was a very simple uh, building. It was also driven by this idea that everything was standardized in terms of the units inside. That freed us up to look at the building envelope and other ideas. So we went back to the client and said, we're going to be a very efficient building, but we want to, we want to bring, elevate the quality of the design. So this shows you the, a very simple idea. All the units were open plan. You can actually open a window there and there and you have cross ventilation. Very important in LA because it's always sunny. You need air. So the premise is that you had circulation down here. Here's the park idea. Now the section is kind of interesting. So in section, this is the public park right here. There's your public park, but we also have the private area, which is the parking underneath the park. Because the thing that drives how many units you can do on these buildings is how much parking can you put into onto the site. So given that the actual site was from here all the way to here, there's the end of the parking lot, uh, the property line. We were able to manage to do it by providing this pocket park above the parking and provide three foot of earth when needed for trees among others. So very interesting premise. Big idea was that we went back to the city. We said, look, we can't keep the house, but we'll give you a pocket park. The city agreed, paid a half a million dollars to, do, to, to, to build the pocket park. And here's the project under construction. This is how uh, you know, wood is, is the way to go in California. It's available, uh, the resources are there. In terms of labor, everyone knows how to build with wood. You make a mistake, you throw out a stud, you replace it. Steel and concrete, very different scenario. But in California, wood is uh, um, uh, more um, budget driven, but it works. Uh, I just want to show briefly uh, this idea that in this building, it was very interested in really developing and choreograph uh, this kind of, in a sense, this facade. All these openings were predicated by where to bring light in, where to have views out, and the balance between both those things. So in a sense, yes, you can produce buildings that are elevated and exciting from a design standpoint, but address those critical issues. And this is the kind of uh, development we do uh, with our buildings. We make sure that it's drawn right, because that's our legal document. So the contractor has to build it the way we designed it. Otherwise, you're in trouble. So, and there's the uh, finished building. So that, as mentioned, a pocket park that's available for the community. It's open at seven in the morning. They close it out at nine in the evening. Very interesting concept, and that's private land. One thing they had to do during this process in terms of this win-win situation for the city and my client was, what happens if someone, uh, uh, an accident on the park, who's responsible? The owners of this building right now, because it is for sale units, the owners own the park, the city leases it. So well, who takes responsibility? The city agreed to take the responsibility. Thus it happened. So it's all these politics that one has to deal with. And that's what I'm saying. These are variables that happen. We were able to get through these humps. Um, and you can see a level of detail. And it was a very simple idea. It's off the shelf material uh, because we had a very, very, uh, a very specific type of units that were stacked vertically and it was built efficiently. It freed us up to be able to pitch this idea to our, our client to say that gives us an opportunity to really do something with the facade. So this is metal, uh, just corrugated metal. It's a more custom size, but if you're ordering quite an extensive amount of metal, you can actually design the profile, and that's what we did. So the red, the red, red elements are vertical, so all the reds, the patterning is vertical. The, horizontal, the oranges are all horizontal, so simple idea, but there's a level of detailing that, so it works, which was challenging, so we're able to put it together. So very happy with this project. More ideas, I just want to tell you a little story. Um, this uh, particular project on the left 
is a um, called the Formosa Cafe, which is half a block away, just down the street. And incidentally, uh, Formosa Cafe was where my dad, who was a film actor, uh, was good friends with Orson Welles. He actually was involved with the Mercury Theater with Orson, and they used to meet here and have coffee. So for me, it was a very, it was close to my heart to do this project half a, um, half a block away from the Formosa Cafe. So to, in a tribute to Formosa, I took the context of the color of the building for our building, not the style, not anything else, simply the color. And that was interesting that in LA, it's where you find context because that's not a big issue in Los Angeles. You can, they're open to ideas. You don't have to necessarily design contextually as to what the building is next to it. But you can find context and it leads to a good idea. So that was Formosa Cafe that's been fully restored recently and that's our product. So that was the balance. This is just sitting in the park or standing in the park looking at the building. This is access to the building. So all the units below, they're all townhouses. So you enter these units at this level for the first two and then up here is the circulation that uh, enters the units on top. I have an image, I think, uh, coming up that shows that as well. More details, street view. <clears throat> now this is the plan as I referred to before. It's a very simple idea. The unit is a through a unit, so you have a studio bedroom here, you have a kitchen, living room, and a balcony. So all this is very much uh, dining, forgive me, and, bal and living room. All this is through, so you can see the light filters through. This is looking down from the stair into the living room, and there's the balcony that is accessed from the second level, and there's the park outside. <clears throat> and the units are also very simple. Uh, we tried a couple of ideas. Uh, here you can see you come up the stair, you have a bedroom in the back, and then you have a unit, also a bedroom here. Uh, that one has the balcony. So this bedroom, which pr frankly, a number of people, you know, the way people live today, they don't use the both bedrooms. One is an office. So we always have, these balconies are quite interesting because they're connected to each of the units. And then we have a, two, a double height space, which you can see in this previous image. So this is the double height space you're looking at right in the front here. So very simple ideas, but we're free to suck to be able to do it. And this is showing a project on the left and under construction. The secondary uh, envelope frames the circulation. You can see someone entering the units on the third floor level. And there's just a picture of the um, park. And I just want to show you this image briefly. This is one that's quite interesting. What if, in terms of the city of Los Angeles, you were able to create these pocket parks and these green spaces and be able to uh, work with the public-private partnerships where perhaps all these uh, buildings, as they, these sites that are as developed, perhaps you can come up with the same idea that you could, you could let a client or a developer build higher in one portion, but to give back a certain part of the site to the community, meaning that you could start to, in a sense, effectively, uh, in a way, walk and experience the city in a very different way. What if one could actually, at, at mid-block, you could walk through it? And this is something that's interesting to me, to be able to do it. And if we've done it, we proved it can be done, we just need other people to get in, to buy into that idea. The city of LA, uh, the, um, years ago after this was done, uh, Vera Ghost is the mayor, had this commitment to do 50 pocket parks throughout the city. He built none of them. This one was the catalyst for that. This was the prototype he was referring to, Formosa. But again, City of LA is an enormous bureaucracy. What, city of West Hollywood, very different. You can get things done. That's why I call it a very creative community in West Hollywood. So this is an idea that I think is, I'm committed to and I, it's something that one should look into. Um, I want to jump now to another project, which is the Sandy Simon Center for Dance at Chapman University. Um, our task was to uh, transform a 1920s industrial packing house, the largest and last operating in Southern California, a packing house for oranges. And we had, were able to take this, uh, we were a mandate of how do we take this existing building and made it into a dance studio. So the project adheres closely to all the historical uh, preservation criteria. We are making sure that we did all that. So you'll see the images coming up. Historical building, we stitched into this building, this dance school, a 40,000 square foot dance school. Very exciting project for me. We do a lot of housing. I'm committed to the culture of people and housing, but I'm very excited to have done this dance school because it, it shows another part of my interest. My wife is actually was a, a ballet dancer when she was younger. So I felt like, yes, I'm, 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 this is the project I'm supposed to do. So. Um, what we had to do with this particular project is do an enormous amount of research, uh, do a look at completed layers of technical reporting on the existing building, making sure 
We keep all the critical aspects of the building, but also free up certain areas. So one of the key areas, or the character defining areas of this project was large open spaces, the saw two clear story, as you'll see in a minute, and also all the exposed structural elements key to the project. So there's an image of it. So this was the Santiago Orange Growers Association packing house. It's on the historical registry since uh, recently. Uh, we, were, we, were, uh, we were actually uh, helping the city to uh, establish it, this historical landmark, because it's a very interesting building. Uh, so that's our building we were working with in the project. So it's very important because obviously the packing house is connected to the years of the citrus industry in, in California. Oranges, orange grows everywhere in this area. So this is where they packed them up. So, and there's an image where they're doing it. So this shows the original interior of the Sun Kiss Villa Park Orchards, demonstrating the factory's assembly line. It originally built as a two-story uh, headquarters in 1918. Uh, again, great bones in this building, very exciting for us. The post and beam heavy timber frame building is, is, is really interesting to work with. I love it, freeze up, open plan, open space. You can then stitch into new programs. And that was what this was about. <clears throat> Hasn't, wasn't in business since the 1960s, so it sat empty for uh, you know, 60 years. And there's a picture of it more recently, uh, an overview like a bird's eye view on the left. And of course, on the right hand side, you can see more the sign of Sunkiss, which we we're required to keep, which is fine. The logo was great, so we kept that. So we had to really approach this a very, very kind of uh, careful way. Here's the exciting uh, main level. Uh, one of the key issues is quite obviously this amazing sawtooth roof where we're able to bring and embrace all the uh, uh, north light coming through those uh, clear story windows. Very exciting space. I mean, imagine being walking in the space. Say, okay, great. We can work with this. Here's what was challenging. <laughs> that was the level below. It was called the dungeon. So it was the basement. For uh, They never knew what to do with this because you can clearly see how awful it is. Now, this is below that image I just showed you. So it's two level. You have this wonderful first main level. And below it was where they just store stuff. Our mandate was to activate both levels. They needed 40,000 square feet for the dance school. And 20,000 was one level, 20 on the second. How can we make that work? So to us, that was our challenge as an architect. So we we wanted to come uh, with a solution that worked. And I remember meeting uh, Colette Krapel, who's the uh, wonderful client at Chapman University. We walked around, and it was this idea, why don't we put this performance space right in the middle, have all these strategic openings, all about light, bringing light down below. And that was the key idea. Uh, it would solve the problem of how you bring life to the dungeon, which is these images. And they had not proposed it. They did not give us that as you can work with both levels. We think you're going to have to live with the top level, and we're not going to be able to get what we want. But if you can figure it out, we'll move forward. Well, we were able to move it out, move forward. So there's a quick section. Uh, cuts uh, in the building, you can see the, the clear story. Uh, lights, uh, the sawtooth roof. So this was very important, of course, from a kind of a, a sustainable area. These were windows that opened, so the hot air would be bring out. These are the existing shell that was here. Uh, here was uh, the cut we made in the building. Uh, we did reuse the existing maple floors for all the cladding of the walls. We took all the flooring that we took out, and we used it in all the walls. So very interesting, sustainable strategy. So the light wells, all the different components were very exciting. There was also a courtyard over here. So we're able to actually connect the actual uh, uh, um, dance school to this courtyard. So if they choose to go outside and have performances outside was really important. So that was excavated, which is very exciting. <clears throat> and big idea uh, in terms of the AXO, here's just a very simple idea. One, two, three, four dance studios. Here's the performance space, which is also a studio when there wasn't a performance. And here were all the cuts we did to bring light down below in terms of the main area. This brought the light, uh, light, a cut there, a cut there, a larger one here, and wrapping around. The form of the geometry of the building was about fluidity, movement, dance. So you can see the geometry is played between rational boxes, but also this idea of, of a circulation uh, and embracing the idea of movement and equally so you can see the courtyard they were able to uh, refine and clean. This was already in works, the courtyard, but it really opened up the, the dungeon level below. So there's two levels, a lower level and an upper level, and then these are all the uh, studios. <clears throat> and there's a model we built, which is fun. This is the nice thing about our practice uh, over the last few years. We've been coming back the last year um, 
When we started, it was right before the pandemic, we built the model. Of course, pandemic happened. We all went remote for 18 months. We're now coming back and it was so refreshing. It's slow, we're a hybrid right now. Three days in the office, two not, not in the office. But models are very important for architects because it's tactile, you can see it, visually get into it. You can see how you begin to uh, develop ideas based on as you're putting uh, you know, materials to each other. You can explore ideas, you can pull things off, put it on. I do think that this idea of models has to come back. My early career at Kevin Roach's, I was there for two and a half years. Roach Tickle and Associates was a great late modernist. Everything they did were models. All I built for two and a half years were models. So it's interesting that here I am, uh, at my age, uh, wedded to this idea of building models. And here's some construction shots. And there's uh, the finished project. And we just photographed this about a week ago. Students came back really very exciting to say that they enjoyed it. They really uh, feel like where they were before were very compressed areas. He had just studios with four foot hall uh, walkways, uh, like corridors. They had no place to hang out. The in-between spaces on this project became so important between their classes. So, uh, and you can see here, one of the key ideas of, the, of this particular building. Also, we took this, so we're inspired by the sawtooth roof and, and applied it in this wonderful wood uh, performance space. So that was an idea that was awfully important. Detailing was rational, simple, uh, had seating where we needed it, but you can see the light that's coming through the uh, whole building. And that's on the third level. We're able to also grab additional square footage on top of the performance space. So this is more of a quiet space seating, we have classrooms, we have different programs up here, but the circulation wraps all the way down. So that's the space below, that was the dungeon, and here's the main space. We also uh, incorporated in terms of material exploration, polygal, which is a highly unique material to try to pitch to an, a client. How's it gonna work? Is it gonna last? It doesn't look very stable. We were able to push the idea that the idea, the lightness of uh, this kind of, uh, uh, the dance, the nature of dance is about being light and movement. So we're able to, to push this idea of this polygal, which really elevated the design in a big way. And this, I've done a, I did an ex, uh, a building about 15 years ago where I used the same material on outside of the building. So I had to get them all in my car and drove them to this building and said, look, this is outside and it's lasted 15 years. Rest assured, if we use this material in your building, it will survive. So we're able to, uh, get them to agree. And the university, you know, they really wanted to look at it, make sure that we're not gonna propose an idea that was gonna fall apart. So we were able to make that work. Just some more images. But you can see the quality of light when you use this polygal. The light from, this, from, the, from the, uh, the clear store windows come through it. You can start to see that quality of that wall. Whites can, walls can be layered. They can have this transparency. You don't always have to be your conventional way of thinking of it. So we wanted to address all those issues in the project. <clears throat> uh, more images. We had a little kitchen area. So this is a hangout space. And this is from below. This is the, the first level, which was the dungeon. And you can see that here's all the recycled wood that we took. As we made these large cuts up here on the main level, we took all that wood and wrapped all the walls in it. So it has a very nice quality to it, uh, the type of material. <clears throat> And just some details looking from uh, below, looking up. As mentioned, detailing is awfully important. We make sure that we can do it. Not to say, you know, we don't make mistakes, but we're able to, if you draw it well and your drawings are good, if it's not built the way it's drawn, you have the ability to go back and say, look, you have to redo that. So there's a few moments like this in the building. But for us, it was the idea of the detailing the base, the top, and also this one is interesting, where this is the performance space in here, and here's the detailing of the wrap. <clears throat> and there's the dance school, there's the performance space on the left, and a, a typical a dance studio. And these are the students who use it. We were able to, uh, this woman, uh, Juliet, was amazing. She's the head of the dance school. She made sure when we shot it, you got to come when we're in action. So we went down the photography, and they shot it in action. Very hard as an architect <laughs> to be able to shoot buildings with people. Very challenging, I think. Uh, we chatted about that earlier. Um, but we're able to, to have the students and people who are engaging the building in the images. So there you have it. That's kind of an exciting project for us is change. Uh, but architects who may be uh, known for one thing are very capable of doing different projects. I've never done a dance school. So we're happy to say that we are already getting bites on 
these type of projects now since this was done. It's all about ideas. So here's, uh, we have uh, one more project and depending on timing, we have another one. So we'll see how it goes. So I'm now gonna shift to supportive housing. Uh, this is awfully important to me as well, this particular project. Um, I will end with this project. So we just have another five minutes. Hang in there, guys. Just for the record, I started at like 13 minutes after five. We're only at, just, this happens to me all the time. It's 6.05, so I got eight minutes, so I'm gonna take a break. I did a lecture last, uh, about four months ago, uh, the Monterey Design Conference. Really interesting, wonderful uh, uh, group of people lecturing, and I was introduced by Reed Kroloff, coincidentally, he was the host, along with Francis Anderton. So they introduced me, they took 20 minutes to introduce me and the uh, events of that day. And then my lecture was one hour, but I lost 20 minutes on the introduction. So I, you were great. No, no, we're good. So I'm gonna tell you that funny story. It's really hard sometimes when you lecture because you are given an hour, but then you never know if you have the whole hour. And, uh, and you guys, one hour is max, I get it. So we're really close. <laughs> but just take a deep breath, we're good, good, good. Now I'll make this quick. So on this particular project, again, very important project, it's a call, we call it the MLK 1101 Supported Housing. It brings 26 units of permanent supportive housing to formerly homeless veterans and chronically homeless families. Project is about, obviously, the, the LA's obsession of having to get people off the streets. It's a disaster. Now, we have a mayor who's really embraced the idea of Karen Bass to really address it and get them, give them a home. And that's what we're doing right now. But it has not worked for many, many years. So we are addressing this project homelessness. We're addressing about bringing equitable design to this typology. Supportive housing doesn't have to be generic. It can be good. It's important. And uh, we are, we are uh, very committed to that idea. Design should not be overlooked in this typology. Uh, at present, as I mentioned, 66,000 people experiencing homelessness in the city of Los Angeles, encampments along everywhere, sidewalks, under bridges, you name it, they're everywhere, and you have to embrace it. I mean, this is the city I live in, and it's wrong. So I'm part of a nucleus of a group of uh, 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 architects and nonprofits trying to address this issue. And this particular area where this project is, it is actually one of the city's poorest neighborhoods, where 33% of the population have an income below the poverty line. And that's uh, uh, important to bring good architecture to these areas. You can see on the left-hand side, it's a, the site is a vacant, unimproved lot. It's on a block that's typical to many parts of the city, next to McDonald's, a strip mall, generic rundown apartments around it. This is the nature of this particular area of South Los Angeles. We are working with homeless communities on this project. They're an amazing group. We've done three with them, three projects. I'm only showing one of the three. Uh, great commitment, they're committed to sustainability, they're committed to doing the supportive housing. It's very difficult to be a nonprofit developer. You have to spend your life trying to get state and federal funding to support these projects. For, and you have to have a commitment to doing work of consequence as a developer, as we do as architects have a commitment to doing work of consequence. But their life is tough. They spend years selling pitching to get money, both state and federal funding, over 16 different agencies to provide the 20 million to build this project. And that's the challenge of these projects. It's not, it's not easy. But this is the area you can see that we're at. You can see on the left-hand side, that's very generic site. You can see in the back area is the alley. Uh, again, areas that are just thrown away, they're left over, no one cares. Uh, we are trying to you know, take these sites and make something out of it. So big idea of the project is created, uh, I won't go into the details of the the development of this, but based on the unit count and based on, unfortunately, to, when this was started four years ago, the requirement for parking, which makes no sense. Why would you need parking for homeless housing? The city still mandates that. So uh, complicated, but these ideas, these parties you're looking at on the left-hand side tells the uh, challenging story. So starting with a very simple idea of this L-shaped building, framing this outdoor space. Then, of course, knowing that we have to tuck parking underneath the building and we can't afford to go subterranean, you have to do it on grade. So then that lifts the building up here. We then said, okay, we have to live with that, but we want this outdoor space to connect to the street because you want these buildings to uh, front the street. You don't want to turn its back to the street. You want to make sure there's connection to that, recognizing that you want to get away from this idea of the solid wall 
and have this inner, inner kind of inward, inward looking building. He wants something that recognizes the street. So all these different moves were very simple ideas uh, and also folding down uh, this particular area so that you come to the street. So there's your party. Uh, it's an L-shaped building, all the access to units from exterior. This is the walkways. Here's, we call it the outdoor living room. We actually made the living room slightly smaller so that it would encourage people to go outside. And when they go outside, they start connecting and socially engage each other. Very important you've been on the street for many, many years. So you bring them outside. It also is healthier when you're outside. So we made a point and we designed the building specific to having this as considered as a living room, outdoor living room. This is the community room and retail below, and there's the stair that uh, connects to the street. And here you can see very driven by sustainability, very important. So all these aspects are built into it's a lead platinum building. So we do have solar collectors. We do have uh, hot water in the building. So we have all the solar, solar hot water system. We have a stormwater management plan. We also have vegetated cool roofs, a variety of different things we've done, drought tolerant plants. We have uh, cross vent passive design strategy, cross ventilation, high efficiency windows. All these aspects are very important. We have these overhangs so that the summer uh, sun does not uh, get uh, penetrate into the units because quite obviously it's like Austin, it's hot. So all these things were built into it and you can do it and still build this for a budget. And that was our challenge. How can we produce this? Uh, early construction shots, as I said, it's uh, 26 units, primarily families. There are many families on the street. So this was about out of the 26, 18 were three bedrooms for families, meaning that uh, 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 perhaps it was one, par one parent with two kids on the street. So that was the primary driver is to get them off the street. So over 18 families live in this building now who are on the street over two years. Some construction, I like to show construction shots because these things don't just happen. There's a, multiple people are involved. You got framers, you got all the different consultants you're working with, uh, great builders, all committed to the same idea. These, these, uh, these builders only do supportive housing. So you can imagine that in itself is a, a tribute to the, the whole team on this project. So here's all the construction, all the complexities and challenges and messiness of building. There's, the, there's the, the, the roof that folds down to the street. There's the stair. We did have to simplify that stair for multiple reasons, uh, but it still is there. Here's the uh, quote unquote outdoor living room, community room, and then starting obviously to build all the stairs among others. And there you start to see that the roof going on in terms of the, green, the, the, the uh, vegetated roof. And there's more construction shots looking across the street. Uh, we worked with Mantle. This one was unique because we had this one challenge. When you work with state and federal funding, there is what they provide a million dollars or two million for your project. They said, okay, we're going to give you this money, but we want you to do something. One of the mandate I had, which I don't have with the others, is we don't want one material wrapping the whole building. So it was like, well, can we have some wood? Can we have some metal? Can we have some stucco? That breaks the massing down. I don't buy that idea. So we at least took the position it can be all white, and that ties it together. Now, white is very interesting in Los Angeles because as the sun hits it, you get shades and shadows, so it starts to change the dynamic of the facade. It isn't just flat. And then you can start to see this, and under construction, you can see we had some vertical panels there. These were flat metal panels or the other areas. So we have a variety of different materials on this, but we did have to mix uh, concrete panels, metal, and uh, plaster, which I rarely do, but we were able to at least fight the good battle to create it as a complete idea. There's the completed building. So this represents, uh, you know, here's the street, stairwell out. We push the fence that you do have security needs. So instead of having this fence right down here and blocking it, this stair is accessible 24 hours a day for anyone on the street who may need to sit and rest. So they're going to private, uh, private property and be able to hang out there, and that's okay. So we do that with all our products. We fight for that move. Very simple, small move, but it has large, in a way, uh, statement, so to speak. You can come onto our property, you can hang out and sit there, and no one's gonna kick you off. Uh, so that's why we have this stoop right here. Uh, there's uh, the finished project right there. Uh, he lives in the building. Uh, Julio, it's a great, uh, really cool guy. He's always on the street, but he lives there. He likes it. He, has, uh, he says he loves that he has a place to live, but he's connected to the street, so he hangs out all the time. Um, there's a view you can see from, uh, obviously, from the courtyard, and that's on the third level, the walkway. Again, there's a level of detail on the handrails, rational, very simple, but there's a level of design that are 
tied into it. For example, here as you walk down, this is perforated metal here. Again, these moves may sound uh, common, but they're not. Uh, to be able to produce these type of moves in these type of products are somewhat challenging. And there are more views looking out to the street. And here's the basic plan. You have this L-shaped building, access to these units. There's the three bedroom right there, for example. Uh, here's another three bedroom, one, two, three. You can see there's a three bedroom. So you can see this was a highly unique scenario where it was about families on the street. <clears throat> and then here's the central area, which is like, in a sense, the kind of gathering spaces, living room, and also the circulation of the stairwell. We made it wider so that people can hang out on the stair as well. Again, very simple image on the right of the unit, and then you can see the, um, the uh, courtyard on the, on the left. And that was a Thanksgiving dinner, so there they are in their living room, so to speak, outdoors. But here's the community room. It has formally a very interesting idea. It has a green roof on top of it, but very open to the uh, area. <coughs> and there's a bird's eye of the living room. Again, pushing ideas of architecture and all those are, these are actually uh, edible gardens that are built, so they, they plant these and eat. This is where they get their vegetables and also um, other types of fruit and stuff, equally so there. <coughs> I like this shot. E e Ewan Baum is a wonderful photographer, took these. He has uh, followed the work and he's, I'm honored. And so he said, I want to go shoot it, so he shot it. But I love the fact that he always shows the grittiness of the city in the images where that is your typical, you know, uh, believe you me, gas isn't 315 now, but um, that's kind of a typical, there's the kind of DNA of it. Now the interesting about this project is that we had zero um, uh, um, nimbyism in this area because of the quality of the design. The conclusion was we presented the city and then presented neighborhood groups. We had two or three meetings. They said, well, your building is, looks better than ours. So it might be homeless housing, but it actually, we can't really, f we can't fight against it. Thus, design does make a, def a difference in these type of projects. If you produce good architecture, there are so many challenges you have in doing these, and there are to be an architect and produce ideas and build ideas. It's not about the formal geometries. It's not about this kind of, uh, you know, glorified objects. It's about all the other variables, the political, the economic, all the other things. And that's really what you have to embrace to be able to uh, tackle to produce. Otherwise, you're going to hit so many walls. But if you see them as assets, it turns better, uh, it can turn out better. So yeah, that's a, I always like this image because it talks about the city. And there's an overall view of it. Here's the building. Here's USC. That's the Rose Bowl. And here's USC. So interesting in USC is this, I've taught there for 12 years. I finally finished as a professor in the spring. And it was, uh, uh, I've often challenged the, uh, the approach, and that is here's a, here's a school embedded in the urban city, uh, and you have this wall around it, but when you go outside, there's a tension, and they really, I feel like, you know, it's an opportunity for USC to really address issues of the city, uh, and they are, which is great. And it's just something that one can imagine if you have a school right here, and then you're dealing with the complexities of people here who aren't students at USC, how do you address those issues and how do you mitigate that in terms of the culture, uh, you know, in a sense, the hybrid between uh, uh, the, the, the culture of a campus and then the individuals who are living on the side. So very interesting. So this building is the poorest area of Los Angeles and it's right next to USC. And that's our building right there. And that's the lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>